Well, welcome to the podcast, Helen. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Now I've been looking forward to this. Any excuse to waffle about fish with someone is always, always good for me. Oh, happy to help with that. Absolutely. Um, you must get it all the time with your surname being Scales and being interested in fish. Does it get old? <laughs> <laughs> no I love it actually I think it's great I, I love that people are like has it, has it, I've just thought of something like yeah. da this new idea no I love it, it um it, in fact I didn't it's my married name actually um oh is I, it okay yeah you know it's funny like I suppose maybe I'm just not one of those girls who was always you know imagining what my name would be like if I if I married this particular person I was with and uh, it was a, a cousin of mine who pointed out to me we were I think we were even engaged at that point possibly or, or maybe not quite anyway she was like you know if you get married you'd be dr scales and i was like oh yes that's what i want one reason Definitely. to get married or the only yeah reason well i mean um, <laughs> <laughs> it certainly was a reason to change my name i'm not sure i would have otherwise but i was like well that's quite memorable really and it has been very memorable lots of people have you know kept me in mind which I don't mind. It's yeah, good. definitely. My because my, my surname sounds a little bit like Perch, and I've had a couple of people say, "Why don't you change it to Perch?" And I'm like, "No, that would be crazy." So I'm not uh, <laughs> not quite going to uh, go that far. Um, but we so we've touched on that. But where did your interest in marine biology start then? So um, I was always uh, a real sort of outdoorsy kid, a real nature kid. Um, my family. I grew up in Surrey most of my younger years so nowhere near the ocean really but um but my family we went to Cornwall a lot on holiday and I could, was never happier than when we were down at the beach um on the coast and um so I kind of it, but it really crystallized for me when I learned to scuba dive and you, you think it might be the other way around I might be into the oceans and then decide to dive and I kind of was but it, it was my first open water dive um that when I got to see it was actually freshwater fish the first fish i met wild fish it was okay. in stony cove um, oh of course it is yeah that's yes. a lot a lot of people lose the virginity in um the yeah, diving let almost... me clarify diving virginity in, uh, <laughs> in stony cove <laughs> i almost gave up on the whole thing uh because it was so very cold and miserable uh, uh it was march it was four degrees i was in a wetsuit suddenly it all seemed like a very bad idea um but then i saw this one little fish and um I suddenly I was in its world I, you know the wall of the aquarium had fallen away and I was in its th three-dimensional space and that just it really it's really switched something in my mind and made me think instantly that I wanted to do this as much as possible so it was really that kind of exploration and uh, being in, in the fish's world that suddenly made me think yes um this is this is for me really um, and the oceans yeah I mean I was very much I guess I don't know suddenly once I got on the ocean as well and then and saw more stuff around the British Isles it was just yeah I was I was hooked <laughs> so I'm guessing it would have been a perch or something wouldn't it in Stony Cove a I don't roach know, maybe actually. It, 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 I don't remember it being uh yeah, it might, but yeah, it probably was. It just seemed like a little silvery thing. It was, to be honest, the visibility wasn't great. No, that would be yeah, thing. it can be. Kicked, obviously, first dive, I kicked the bottom, you know, the sediment had come up so I could hardly see anything. I remember my dive instructor had had tied me to to her um, with a leash, like we had a long line. <laughs> and that just, All right. Like a dog, like he was. Yeah. Like she was taking me for a walk, and then once we got the visibility was poor, I, I could see why why she did that because it was obviously going to be a bit tricky to find me in the dark. So this little silverfish kind of came out of the murk and then swam off. It, it yeah, it was just yeah. the way it moved and the way I was just in its world was just really mesmerising. It was great. Yeah, it, it can seem strange to people when you go oh, a big a big dive quarry in Leicester and they be like oh what's special about that? But yeah, yeah. when you're down there, it's um it's pretty pretty amazing i mean I'm, we're, I'm pretty much preaching to the converted with with yourself and me really but why should people care about fish i guess is the million dollar question yeah. because it's something i'm up against quite a bit when i'm trying to plug fish to people who are more familiar with with birds and mammals and i suppose obviously you're a, a big champion of fish with the books that you've written so why should we give a monkeys about fish well, I mean, I think they get a bit of a hard time, don't they? I mean, they're vertebrates, just like the birds and the mammals and the uh, amphibians and the, perhaps the other animals that people think about more and perhaps associate more with, I don't know, with being interesting and uh, something that you'd care about. And I just always had this feeling that, that fish have sort of had a bit of a, a raw deal, if you like, because they're seen as being so different. And I don't know if it's something to do with their co being cold blooded and out of sight. You know, you don't see the beauty of a fish unless you've got your head in the water or, you, you know, you're watching a lovely film or seeing pictures and so on. And so they have this reputation, don't they, of being cold and slimy and smelly yeah. and kind of boring. Um, 
And, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so in terms of just the wonders of the wildlife, um, that alone, you know, it's just, you know, they are this extraordinary group of enormously diverse animals. What is it? It's like 40,000 species, 50,000 maybe. I mean, it's, it's sort of those sorts of numbers are hard to pin down. And within that group, so much diversity in form and diet and behavior and color and shape and all these things. And yet maybe it's also something to do with the fact that we, you know, that fish are food and that it's hard to relate uh, something that you eat to the the animal that it comes from when you almost put down a wall in your mind like you don't want to think about lambs you know frolicking through the meadows and then and then you have lamb lamb roast lamb for dinner and that you make that kind of division and maybe fish suffer from that too but i do think there is just it is hard to get people to like fish as uh, appreciate fish as 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 wonderful interesting animals and not just food I mean, I don't know if that's something you find as well, that it's sort of, it's getting through that barrier almost. Yeah, I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier in that um, most people's experiences of fish are either in the fishmongers looking a bit lifeless. You might see an angler holding one, but even then it's not quite the same if it's gasping for air in someone's hands. But then if everyone uh, could see them in the wild, or if you watch, you know, or if you're not going to jump in the water, just watch a film about, you know, a coral reef or something, they do take on a much uh, more vivid lifestyle and greater appeal. So, yeah, it's um, it's trickier to get people interested in them. I think you have to work harder. Like um, whenever you see any of the the blue chip wildlife, the big Attenborough series, if there are fish on it, the fish have to be doing something really, really out there. I mean, the one that sticks out in my mind was, um, I can't remember if it was Blue Planet 2, which would have fish on, obviously, or it might have been a different one, but there were trevally that were eating birds. I don't know if you remember oh, that. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I think they were yeah, giant yeah. trevally, and you saw these, um, oh, I can't remember what the birds were, petrels or frigate birds or something like that. And they were just sat on the water, like, oh, lovely, lovely. And then, poof, these, <laughs> yes. um, yeah. these trevally were nailing them. And I think it's things like that which get people like, oh, my God, look at that. And you've got to just work harder to get people to be, be interested in the fish. a bit more spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's it. I mean, I don't. I think historically as well, there's just, even, even among scientists, there's just these almost assumptions that fish are lesser beings and therefore less interesting, that they're not as intelligent. They, they lack the ability to be as intelligent as, say, birds even. I mean, obviously, as mammals, but birds as well and things like that. Um, that they can't, you know, that they, they lack so many things that make life rich in other animals, that, that, that fish are silent, that they can't hear something, that they, you know, that, that um, they, yeah, perhaps are pretty small brain, pea-brained animals that don't have that level of complex behaviour. And yet, actually all those things aren't true you know that, that's um but you have to ask those questions of those animals in the right kind of way otherwise you don't necessarily appreciate what the intelligence um of a fish can be i mean like for example there's, there's that awful you know myth of uh, a goldfish having a seven second memory or whatever yeah. it is you know yeah, yeah yeah it's five seconds seven second you know and that really sticks around and people kind of believe that yeah but but i think scientifically it's partly just because those animals uh, whether it's a sort of simple organism like a zebrafish which is kept in in labs all around the world and loads of science is done on them but you've got to you've got to study them in the right way in order to test things like their memory um how do you ask a goldfish if it remembers <laughs> you know but there are ways of doing it but you have to do it in the right sort of way um i think they trained um sorry helen i think they trained goldfish um I'm sure it was a football. They trained a goldfish to play a foot in a, a football in a little tank. And then they didn't do it for three months. And they put the stuff in again to see if it remembered. And it remembered. So at the very yeah. least, I know you might know this more than me, but they've at least got a three month memory, which, you oh, know, definitely. Is, yeah, yeah. No, better absolutely. than mine, to be fair. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they've shown that sharks uh, have long, long memories and that that can go for sort of years, I think. Um, oh wow okay uh so no i mean longer lived fish i guess you know you'd expect them to be able to have uh remember things long but goldfish should live for longer too I and mean, that's one of the myths is that myth that goldfish only live for a short amount of time but that's not true at all if they're looked after well in captivity that is um yeah they can live for decades um yeah. it's just that people don't really know maybe if you go home from the the fair with a goldfish in a bag you might not know what you're doing with it but um you know so there's all these yeah all these ways in which it's hard to appreciate how complex and interesting the lives of fish actually are until you really dig into it i suppose do we know where uh, you've got me thinking now do we know what the smartest fish are Ooh. 
Am I well, putting you on the spot now? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking there's things that fish do that are kind of surprising. Okay, yes, I know a really smart fish, actually. Um, a cleaner wrasse. You know, okay. these little fish on coral yeah. reefs. Yeah, I've seen them in the I Red mean, Sea, yeah. Yeah, and you know, these wonderful little things. I mean, they're only this sort of finger-length sized uh, little wrasse, little fish that... Um, that pick off dead skin and parasites from all the other animals on a reef. Um, and there's a couple of different species that do this, but they, yeah, they're small fish. They've got a tiny wee brain. And yet to, to be a successful cleaner wrasse, to be a cleaner fish, to, to provide that role, to, to use that as your source of food on a reef, um, requires really quite complex behavioral um, abilities and cognition. And, um, you know, it might not be that it's the most intelligent fish out there, but it's certainly one that's been studied quite well. And we do know that they have amazing ability to remember things um, and to work things out. So, you know, they will memorize. And um, so they hold these little territories where um, other bigger fish will visit to get clean, sometimes dozens of times a day, possibly just because it feels nice. And that's another yeah. thing about fish is that fish, you know, they do have, they, they can peel pain and they, they do seem to have a sense of pleasure as well. Um, and uh, some fish do seem to go to cleaning stations just uh, just because it feels feels nice to be kind of massaged and picked over by these cleaner ass. Um, but the ras will remember individual clients. They'll remember hundreds of different individuals. They'll remember last time they were they were cleaned. They work out whether this is a fish that you need to be very well behaved around because it's likely to eat you. Because you've seen those pictures of like a big grouper, or a big predatory fish with its mouth wide open or a moray eel or something. And these little cleaner rats will climb into its mouth, you know, in any second there, the fish could, the, the moray eel could just snap its jaws closed and that would be dinner time. Um, but the ras uh, convinces it not to do that, but knows it has to, it has to behave uh, absolutely brilliantly, perfectly, um, without any kind of cheating. Because actually what the ras really wants to do is take a bite. Uh, it doesn't really want to eat just parasites. Um, it wants to eat a bit of nice fish flesh, actually mucus on the outside of fish, which has... Um, sunscreen in it, which is kind of important on a coral reef because of all the UV light on the shallow tropical seas. And it's in, the, it's like fish have it in the, the mucus on the outside of their body and it helps like a, basically like a sunscreen, but they can't produce it, they have to consume it. So what a rat really wants to do is take a bite of that, but it won't do that if it's a, a predator that's likely to eat it. But it will cheat against uh, herbivores. It knows if it's something like a rabbit fish that just eats seagrass and seaweeds, it can occasionally take a nip and um, the rabbit fish won't be happy and it will be like, ah, little flinch. But then the cleaner rest will apologize as well. And it knows it has to, it knows it has to apologize and it will rub, uh, give the, the rabbit fish a little massage. And it's basically saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't, I won't do it again. I promise, promise. I won't do it again. I promise. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so their social lives, I mean, and they, they, they cheat to, against those pairs, male, female pairs that have these really complex behaviors between them. So yeah, they're very smart. They're very smart creatures. It's amazing how those behaviours start out. You think, when did the first wrasse go to a moray eel, go in its mouth, and then when when did that moray eel think, you know what, I'm not going to chomp you because you're picking my yeah. teeth clean. It, it, it's absolutely mind-boggling, isn't it? Because I it guess is. you could argue that somewhere down the line, other fish maybe saw that and thought, oh, that, that looks beneficial. But how did they start? You know, it's it's... It's crazy, isn't it's it? It's always those starting out, isn't it? With anything you think, yeah, what was the first step? I, I don't know wh whether we know anything about the evolution of um, cleaner wrasse. I imagine no. it was probably, probably slowly, slowly, maybe the same yeah. fish first, perhaps. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I mean, but we, what we do know is that they play a really important role on reefs. If, you know, if they're experimentally excluded from an area, um, the fish living there really do get quite sick from the parasites and having bits. You know, they, they need that kind of hygiene service played by the, these rats. Um, so it's a, it's definitely win win, I think. For, yeah, for those yeah. Do we have anything similar in the UK at all? Do you know if the, do we? Yeah, I don't know actually. I mean, because it's not just rats. Shrimp also play that role in some parts, but again, I think mostly tropics. There yeah. were there were gobies in the Caribbean. Um, but again, I think more tropical that do a sort of cleaning role. I think, well, the thing is now what I'm thinking of actually is I think RAS in general will do that because of what there is happening here in the UK is there is, um, there are collections, I think even of maybe even um, lump suckers perhaps, but also RAS in Devon that are being sent up to Scotland for the salmon farms. I don't yes. know if you've heard about Yeah, that. no, yeah, I do know about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's destabilizing ecosystems, isn't it? If you're taking all these yeah. RAS away. Um, yeah. Then yeah, I have heard about that. It's a big problem. So I guess it? they are doing a bit of a cleaning role. They must be picking yeah. off. I guess that's the reason they're putting them in these salmon farms is to try and remove the parasites from these farms. Salmon. Yeah, so, there must yeah. be something in it, I guess. So I guess it does. Yeah. It does happen here. So I, I always find it fascinating when you can find parallels between 
things that happen in the tropics and they happen right here in the UK. So I've mentioned, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times on the podcast, but one of the ones is, do you know about groupers and eels in coral reefs when you'll get, a, a, um, I don't know if the grouper follows the eel, the eel follows the grouper, but we get that in the UK with perch and eels. Really? So yeah, yeah. So uh, a, a big freshwater eel will be searching for food and it'll be flanked by a couple of perch. And when the perch, when the eel's looking for bullheads or crayfish or whatever, when something darts out, the perch will dart and snatch and grab it, which I find fascinating because that's a learnt behaviour. So again, it's just this this little slimy brown fish that no one think you know thinks are unintelligent and uninteresting. It's learnt something. So I think that's really you know really fascinating. It's something I'd love it to. I've, I've filmed a little bit of it, but I'd love to go in depth on that because I think that'd be fascinating. Oh, yeah. to, oh you need to, to definitely. Because it's all this is all part of like really deconstructing this idea that fish are are boring and dumb and yeah. stupid, you know, and, and are not interesting. But you know, it really busts that myth if you can show that sort of cool stuff happening. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. And obviously, you've done lots of books in it, and you've recently written a book, the the Brilliant Abyss, about the deep sea. So I wondered when you were researching and you were you were working on this book, what did you find out that that surprised you? Oh, everything about the deep sea, to be <laughs> honest. I mean, it is the biggest and most surprising place. Um, uh, I guess I'm just almost surprised that we feel that way because it is, it's the, it's the dominant living space on our planet. That's something like 95% of the biome, the living space that uh, living creatures can occupy is, is the deep sea from 200 metres down to the very bottom. Is that right? To 11, wow. 000. You know, if you think about the depth and the volume of the ocean, it's it's something like a billion cubic kilometers it's ridiculously big i worked out that if uh, and i can't remember the number of it but i think it was something like if for every deep sea biologist if you divided up the ocean between them they'd have some enormous number like 50 million cubic <laughs> miles or something stupidly high number I don't to go actually. around um so so it's a huge space um therefore kind of i don't know it is it is earth it is so much of our planet it's deep ocean um so in a way we shouldn't be surprised but of course we are because we're not familiar with this place and and because it's such an extreme environment for anything to live in i mean it was only maybe 150 years ago not so long that it was generally thought that nothing lived in the deep ocean that, that beyond maybe 500 meters perhaps everything beyond that was just empty um and it kind of made sense to think that because you know the conditions are so extreme i mean there's there's no light really after certainly after a thousand meters there's no sunlight um there there's virtually there's very little food or well, people thought there was no food at all um and the pressure is immense so how could anything survive down there um so it was kind of assumed for various reasons that nothing was there but you know we, we couldn't have been that people couldn't have been further from the truth i mean the ocean the deep ocean is is full of extraordinary life that has evolved all these weird, weird adaptations to be able to survive in those extreme conditions. So we see, you know, these delicate creatures, these animals made of jelly, all sorts of jellyfish, gelatinous creatures that you think, well, how on earth can that survive? You pick one up and it would just fall through your fingers. But it's exquisitely adapted to high pressure, to surviving in a very low food environment, sometimes very low oxygen environments. Um, you know, worms that have evolved a diet of bones, you know, the occasional whale that ends up in the deep sea, and they specialize in eating those. Um, so it's all strange, but actually Equinemus shouldn't be strange because it is, it is our, you know, it's so much of our planet. But um, every time people look, any time a scientist pretty much puts their head in the water, they're submersible in the, in the deep, we find something unexpected and cool. I was going to try and film every um, marine fish in the UK. I was thinking, yeah, I, I could have a go at that. And um, I think there's roughly around 400 species. I mean, it, you know, depends who you ask. And I thought, okay, well, that'll take me a while. But I looked into it and the vast majority of those are deep sea. And how would you go around? <laughs> how on earth would you do that? And there's some really weird stuff just off the British coastline. You know, there's, um, oh, I can't remember. There's some really weird sharks and chimeras and, and, and stuff that we, you wouldn't even think that we get in, in the British Isles that, that we get here so it is just a an utterly fascinating environment that we've we've got down there and I guess out of all the uh topics that you could do why why deep sea then it was just something that you you had always been interested in or was it just a topic that there's, there's mystery or you wanted to highlight it what was the rationale behind writing this book so it was a combination actually I mean the deep has been um 
it's been in my mind since I was an undergraduate and I first started hearing uh, about some of the organisms that live in the deep ocean. Things like, st I remember very clearly having a lecture on the stop light loose jaw, this bizarre deep sea fish that has red bioluminescence. And most things have blue bioluminescence, this ability to glow in the dark. 75% of stuff that lives in the deep can glow. It's not unusual, but red light's really unusual. And this guy has this sort of sneaker scope vision which they think they evolved we think they evolved so that they can see but nothing else can because most animals in the deep can if they can see anything they can see blue light not red so they've almost got this night vision goggle stuff going on which is just just so cool um so it's been in my mind since then um and i've always you know been aware of the extraordinary discoveries being made in the deep but actually the kind of the timeliness of this book happened um as i've just increasingly had a real sense of urgency to tell people um, about, well, I guess two things. One, I do genuinely think we've got, we're in a golden age of discovery in the deep because we've got such amazing technologies now, um, remote operated submersibles that can go down and, and explore beneath the waves um, and bring back high definition video footage in the real time, things like that. So we are making amazing discoveries like never before, but at the same time, humanity is also pushing uh, its impacts into the deep more than ever before. And that was sort of what it, I felt like now was the time to write this book because um, you might think, oh, you know, the deep sea is so big and it's so far out of the way that surely can't be touched by human impacts. But but it is. I mean, sadly, it is, whether it's pollution, um, fishing or even new forms of um, resource extraction and exploitation like deep sea mining, which is coming up potentially. I really felt like now is a time that I wanted people to know more about the deep and why it matters and the sorts of impacts that humanity is having in there. Yeah, no, it, there's a huge amount, isn't there, to left to discover. And I think it does capture your imagination a little bit because it is, you know, it's deep, it's dark and everything that seems to live down there just looks, I suppose monstrous is unfair, but they look alien. They look very, very weird to anything you'd find. Even in shallow water, a lot of the stuff down there is just bigger teeth and bigger eyes and whatnot. And they just look kind of, uh, otherworldly don't they oh yeah it does it's um as i say i think like there's just someone the other day said oh do people find things in the deep sea that uh, you know, they were expecting to find and i think well no normally what we just find stuff that nobody was expecting you just have to look and you'll see something weird and different um, and i think it does it really comes back to the uh, the fact that the conditions are so extreme in the deep whether it's yeah food availability and, and so forth and the high pressure that it means that things evolve in a very different way to on land it's just it's fundamentally a different place the pace of life is different things tend to live incredibly slowly and for a very long time you know we've got corals that live for thousands of years we think the oldest living coral possibly has been alive for four, over four thousand years um things like that just make you know it's all just it is mind-blowing um isn't there a and shark that too. lives 400 yeah. years or something? That, that's Greenland deep sea. Shark. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Greenland yeah. sharks. Yeah. I mean, that's it's the 400, but plus or minus. I mean, the kind of the estimates, they figured out the, the estimate, the rate, yeah, their age from them, uh, from, I think it's their cornea has, de has deposits from the time they were testing nuclear weapons in the, in the Pacific. And there's this bomb pulse uh, that's penetrated into marine ecosystems and into the deep. And you can measure that. And work out when that happened relative to you know to the age of that animal and you know and it's like well it's 400 plus like i think it could even be you know closer to a thousand years old but we don't quite you know have that that error bar quite sort of yeah. narrowed down but yeah no really the longest certainly the longest lived vertebrates that uh, have ever been you know aged at this point um and loads of invertebrates that live way way longer as well so yeah long life is something that happens in the deep um gigantism is also something we get in the deep quite yes a lot. yeah things. yeah yeah uh, yeah we... well giant squid obviously <laughs> that's one yeah, yeah we, we did a whole podcast about it um a few when was it a few weeks ago with katrin um it's really bad of me for not remembering her last name but like katrin lintz i think was her name katrin yeah, from yeah Bass. yes that's it yeah do you know yeah, her yeah yeah I yeah, do, yeah. Yes. so yeah she was she was brilliant we had a really good chat about um all kind of weird we mentioned the bloop do you know the bloop this oh, big the noise in the Antarctic, sound, yeah, yeah the that no sound. that no one, all these conspiracy theories about what it yeah. is, whether it's a huge unknown animal or whether it's ice. I don't know. I like to think that it's some really weird animal that we've not found yet, but who knows? What did Would. Catherine say? What did she? Say? She was she um she kind of thought it was biological. Yeah, she was kind of more leaning that way, but she didn't say like what it could be. But yeah, wow, who knows what it is? So cool. maybe maybe one day. Um, so sticking with books, you also did a, a children's book on, on the Great Barrier Reef, 
Or, you, or it's not out yet, is it? But it is no, coming it is out. out. Yeah, it, it is out. That it's one's out. out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I just wondered what prompted you to write about the Great Barrier Reef, but specifically aiming it at children. So why not just do uh, a, a book to adults on it? Why would you aim it at kids? So it's my first kids book. So this is all new for me. I've been doing adults books for a few years now. And it's something that's been on my mind that I would like to do and have the opportunity to to do that. And it's a picture book as well, which means that's a different way of writing as well, because, well, A, it's much shorter. And that was the big challenge for me was was bit, was was using far fewer words than I'm used to, um, but uh, got there in the end. Uh, I remember sending the first draft off to my editor and they said to me, you know, have this many pages with maximum this number of words per page. So of course I maxed it out and wrote, wrote that many. And they were like, yeah. And they actually edited it and cut the number of words in half, which was at first I was like, what, where are my words? But they did such a good job. They kept the kind of real essence of the book. So uh, it was a very, very, very good edit. Um, so using using words and pictures together was something I I really wanted to do. You know, using that visual um, element as well, um, and obviously children's books is a, is the obvious way to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just another way of of getting those stories across, really, um, uh, to to a younger audience. And, yeah. Um, I yeah. really enjoy speaking to the younger audiences. I've oft, I've been doing that for for longer. You know, things like science festivals, that kind of thing. Yeah, I saw some and, stuff uh, on YouTube with you, uh, with some kids asking questions, actually. I was what, to, for research for this, and I thought um, th the kids were really well informed. They, I, I don't know if you know, I can't remember exactly what, but you probably know the video. That I'm might have about. been the Royal um, the royal Institution. That, there is it, one up online, and they do ask really good questions. They were, yeah, because, <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you, you, you make these assumptions, oh, they're just going to ask, you know, all the usual stuff but they were really kind of into it and uh, and I thought you handled it really well as well so it was a good the, the, the kids ask the the best and the hardest questions yeah they really do um uh so it's always great fun doing that so I, I guess I always felt quite you know excited and and um talking to young audience is something I enjoy doing very much so it kind of made sense for me to do it in a book form um and actually do you know I didn't I didn't find it so different no, I, I honestly don't think I think I'd be writing about the same sorts of things if it was a book for older, older readers, just, you know, to a different, perhaps maybe slightly different level of, well, I've got, you know, more words. So I go into more detail, perhaps, but I expected it to be more different than it was, but actually not so much. I mean, you know, it's almost it's easier with kids because they're going to be interested. right? Yeah, they have that kind of natural a bit more just that passion for science and nature and stuff and, and they can really go for it that's so refreshing actually it is really lovely I don't know how much if you ever get a chance to sort of talk about your work with younger people but I do find that the the enthusiasm they can aim back at you is really it's really inspiring actually yeah um I, a, a few times yeah not not a huge amount I'm not um I'm not I'm not much of a kid person if I'm completely honest with you I don't go around hitting them in the street or anything no, but, no, um, no. but um, not not yet. We'll see how it goes. But um, but yeah, no, I mean, from from when I have spoke to kids who are interested in what I do, then, yeah, they are. They are incredibly passionate and they often have this sort of just um, quite nice naivety. Like like you say, they'll just ask you a question that an adult wouldn't ask you or, or they'll be interested in something or notice something that maybe an adult wouldn't notice. So it's quite nice to see it through a new a new set of eyes, which yeah. I do like that. So I think, yeah, there is a there is a, an upside to it. Yeah, yeah, for Definitely. sure. But I did really enjoy doing the kids book. And the thing I'm sad about now is right now I'm not allowed to go. Obviously, we're not going to schools or anything, which was one thing I was really hoping to do. So, you know, that'll change, I'm sure. And I've got some, yeah. uh, a couple more kids books that I'm working on now. So hopefully, you know, that will happen when yeah. we're allowed. Exactly. So, yeah, we can yeah. we can but dream, can't we? And Indeed. you you did a series with The Guardian on sharks as well, I believe. And I wondered, why do you think people are so captivated by sharks as opposed to to other fish it always seems to be there sharks are the exception whenever you talk to people about fish as we were talking about earlier often it can be a little bit deflating uh, but sharks just everyone loves sharks you know and if you look at magazine i, I remember pitching some stuff to bbc wildlife magazine and um and i was like oh yeah no, let's get a trout on the front cover and they were like no no way no way <laughs> but a great but a great yeah. white shark no problem they'll put that on the front yeah, um so yeah so yeah. what is, what do you think it is about sharks well, it's a bit of a love-hate thing with sharks, isn't it? I think yeah. there are those people who kind of fundamentally, uh, myself included, have always thought that they are just brilliant and, you know, fascinating and beautiful creatures. I mean, there's hands down. I mean, they're, they're pretty much, I'd say, am I right? Would I be right in saying that they're the biggest predators in the ocean? Fish predators, um, you know, 
fish predators apart from yeah killer yeah they would be I guess so yeah so the fi- got as that. fish they are yeah 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 so you know they've got that position perhaps and maybe that's partly it that they are such big animals and there's just something about big things that i think people find um captivating whether it's because they're terrified or you know in some kind of state of awe but there is something about a big animal that is different to little things i mean i personally obviously i i also find absolute joy in the tiniest wee things as well yeah. but there's just something about a big the presence uh and the magnificence of a big yeah. animal is is hard to resist so maybe that's partly it even though there are smaller sharks as well um, yeah. but then obviously there's the hate side and and uh and there is still this sort of uh instilled fear of sharks and, and you know to some extent that that's fair enough they are you know they are top predators and unfortunately people do occasionally come in count have have uh, dangerous encounters with sharks um but the it's so pervasive like you know even some of my very best friends who know me so well and know what i do and know that I go diving with sharks and have, you know, all these experiences with them, we'll still basically say, yeah, no, not for me. Yeah. Not for me. Um, And I'm kind of fascinated by that. And I don't know, it seems so ingrained. Do you know what I mean? Like really kind of, it's hard to shift that feeling of, you know, as much as I say, you know, I think I need to just bring them and show them some sharks and then maybe be in near them and then they can see for themselves. But it's really hard to get across that. That, again a sort of barrier i suppose yeah i mean whether it's the whole the thing with jaws whether that kind of equally d- scared people but interest people in discovery got shark week every year and they were you know people get obsessed with sharks and maybe sens- sensationalize them a little bit too much but um people just seem seem to be fascinated by them and i, I think as well sharks just have better marketing in my eyes, in that, yeah, in that yeah. you know, like take a swordfish for example. It's, uh, it's a big, a big animal, similar size to a lot of sharks, but you and try and infuse predator, fast yeah, swimming, exactly. Yeah. You know, or sunfish. You know, sunfish. I think I'm right in mm-hmm. saying that sunfish are the largest bony fish in the world, yeah, and they, they can the get heaviest, enormous, yeah. absolutely really... enormous. So they are super, super cool. I mean, yeah. But you're right, though. There is something like sharks. Yeah, they do have that kind of excitement about them that other it is hard to equal with other other fish yeah so maybe we need to sort of yeah i don't know perhaps somehow try and do well you're, you're doing it you know but again sort of try and equalize things a bit in the i think so world. it's showcasing yeah. all the other stuff and and one fish i wanted to talk to you about actually uh and you'll you'll know as soon as i say uh, the species why i want to talk to you about this is uh, is the pearl fish Ah. okay now you can probably go where, <laughs> now you'll know where i'm leading with this now but obviously <laughs> listeners will be like oh this seems perfectly innocent it's a nice name isn't it it is it's a look mm. it conjures up you think of this lovely smooth uh fish but so <laughs> that, why that does wh- help. <laughs> yes smooth does so why 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 have i brought that up why what is special about a pearl fish well it lives somewhere special doesn't it <laughs> uh <laughs> let's paint a picture so um uh, near a coral reef in the tropics, but away from where where those corals grow, there's often sandy lagoonal areas where there's not a lot there. It's usually just sort of open areas of, of flat sand, so there's not a lot to hide behind or or you know make a home in. If if you were a little fish that needed somewhere to hide, except there are um, animals lying around on the seabed, relatives of uh, starfish and sea urchins, things called sea cucumbers that look like well sausages or possibly grosser worse things than that but um inanimate and they are animals but they look fairly inanimate lying around on the seabed tubular creatures um and these little fish the pearl side have discovered that if they can get in um which they they find a way in uh that living inside uh the bums obviously cucumbers is a nice place to hide and a safe place to hide so they do they live exclusively in basically inside the intestines of lower intestines of these uh sea cucumbers and they get in and out through the bum so it's funny, like we were mentioning earlier about the, the first cleaner rasp, but when did the first pearl fish decide, <laughs> oh, this is where I'm going to hide? I got this Whoop. cucumber's arse, basically. Yeah, so. I mean, I could sort of almost see that a bit more. You might just be swimming around. I and guess, then, I yeah. Because also we should point out that sea cucumbers also breathe through their arses, so they have to take a breath. And actually, I think that's how the fish get in. Well, now they know what to do, is that I think they basically just wait there or just almost because at some point the, the kissy cucumber is going to take a breath and so whoop, in they go as soon as that um orifice is open 
So it's not symbiotic. The, the sea cucumber gets bugger all out of this. It does not want a pearl, so. a pearl fish in no, its No, I really um, think it doesn't. Cavity. I think it's a bit parasitic, actually. I mean, oh no, there, no, I think they might even feed on some of the bits inside. I think it ah. might be. There might even be some nutrition involved. So no, um, it's amazing though, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. And if you see it and you think, oh, it's a little fish, it's actually quite big compared <laughs> to the size of the uh, size of the cucumber. Yeah, it's not a tiny wee thing. It, you know, it's it's. It's substantial. Yeah. So they, they must know it's there. It's sure. cause for concern. I'd is, say but, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll end on this last one. And, and, I, and I guess you must you must get asked this constantly, but do you have a favourite fish? Oh, well, if I tell you mine, will you tell me yours? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm assuming you yours is the pearl time. fish. Well, you know, well, you can have that if you want. Um, it's such a great question, and I always my kind of cop out is one that I, is that I sort of keep changing my mind, and that I have like my favourite fish of the week sort of thing. Um, and it is true actually, because a lot of the work I do involves you know doing a lot of research and reading and thinking about different parts of the world, deep sea coral reefs. So I'm always encountering new things that um, I didn't know about before. So you know, so I have new things coming up all the time. So this week actually, so. Um, I genuinely am really amazed that we've just heard that uh, a kite fin shark that lives in the deep sea is bioluminescent. And these guys can grow to like a meter, one meter 80, I think. So they're really big, pretty big sharks. Yeah. Um, and they can glow in the dark. How cool is that? Kite, kite, right. I'm going to, I'm going to Google kite that. Fin kite fin shark. Kite fin shark. They're also okay. known as, um, I think they also have the name of something like a seal shark which i've never heard them called that but apparently yeah kite okay. fin or, or seal okay um, dilatius lica they live down yeah down in the deep um and we've known about them for a while but um the thing with bioluminescence is it's um not a very easy thing to prove you either you either have to see you know see the animal using its bioluminescence sometimes it's quite it's not a constant light it could be no, sort of a flash no. of light so you have to be looking in the right place at the right time if you're in a submersible or you've got a camera down there um, and there are ways of doing it in the lab, but you know you've got to look after these animals and bring them up carefully, and so on. So I think there could be a lot more. There are lots of sharks that are bioluminescent, which we know about already, but this is the biggest one. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. And one idea they have, which really makes my mind spin, is that because a lot of the smaller sharks have bioluminescence, probably for a thing called counter illumination for trying to disguise their silhouettes um, in the sort of twilight zones of the ocean, but sort of two hundred meters to a thousand meters, where there's a bit of inky blue light. Um, and these, they put blue light on their bellies to sort of match that surrounding light. So they aren't this dark shadow swimming overhead, if you like. Yeah. Um, and probably to try and avoid predators. So why is this big predatory shark doing this sort of similar sorts of things? Maybe it's doing something else. And one idea is that it's illuminating the seabed. They actually live just above the deep seabed. Maybe they're illuminating the seabed so they can hunt, basically, like a, a, a searchlight wow. um, for their food. We don't know. It's just an idea, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is a good one, isn't it? Yeah, mine doesn't sound as impressive as that now. So I, I would I would normally say grayling, but for the sake of sanity, because I'm sure most people on this podcast have heard me waffling about grayling constantly, <laughs> I'm going to say something different today, which is uh, burbot, which oh, okay. are purely because I like to think that we might be able to get them. You know, we've got bee evangelicism about bringing beavers yeah, back, and I'd love you. to think that we could get bee. Uh, I'd love to think we could get burbot back. Because what fascinates me about them is they're a freshwater cod for a start. They can breed under ice. They they lay their eggs when it's when it's very cold. Millions of eggs, uh, in, in fact. And that they were a species that went extinct in the UK in living memory. That the last one that was recorded was 1969, I think. Oh, wow. So we talk about losing these animals hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But there would have been people who would have seen a bird, but who were still alive oh. today. So I would love to see them back. And they're not the, well, to the eye of the beholder, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I think they're very beautiful fish. Most people would probably think they're quite ugly because they've got kind of whiskers and they're uh, kind of bottom dwelling looking thing. I think they're absolutely fascinating. So I would say they're my favourite fish today. And uh, I'd love to see them back, hopefully, one oh, day. Is anyone working on that? Is there any yeah, yeah, there are. There are plans afoot. Yeah, they... Um, because we think they went extinct because of a combination of pollution and habitat loss. And now oh. um, there's been feasibility studies done. And we think, well, the, not that we think, the feasibility said that they could come back. So there are plans to hopefully reintroduce them. So you never know. In a few oh. years time, you might have the, the burbot back in the UK, which would oh, be brilliant. Be super cool. Definitely. Yeah. 
So I'll be there if they do. I'd love to. See, I'd love. Yeah. I have actually seen one. Actually, I saw they they tried to reintroduce them in two thousand and seven, and I was able to go see one then. Um, okay. But uh, they are yeah, they're weird looking things. But so hopefully cool. we can we can get them back. But um, look, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you, Helen. Anything to talk about fish for an hour is always um, always good. If people want to get your books, where's the best place to to go? So um, you could check out my website, helenscales.com. And actually, um, if you don't mind me doing a, a wee plug and it's no, for, go for, for a it. good cause, um, you'll find a link on there um, from my latest book, The Brilliant Abyss. Um, basically, it'll take you over to bookshop.org, which is a, an online bookseller, but it helps to support independent local bookshops. And so part of the money, if you order it through my my little shop, Dr. Helen Scales on, on Bookshop, um you will be not only supporting um an independent bookseller but i will get a small commission and i'm donating my commissions to uh, the marine conservation charity sea changes so um so i would love you any so i've got all my books are up there i'm also going to start putting up some of some other titles things i've read your book i'm sure will be up there as well um and then just you know just help raise a bit of money for for that very good cause to help yeah. save um things in the british seas well, I, I can put a link to that in the description of the podcast so people can find that nice and uh, nice and easy. And I've, I did get a copy of, of Helen's book and it is uh, I've only just started it, but it is pretty good reading and some really weird and wonderful stuff that we've we've got in the deep sea. But look, it's been a pleasure and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great fun.